Hey everybody, it's Angie and welcome to Hot and Flashy. Coming to you from my living room today because I was just sitting here where I normally work at my laptop. I was reading emails and looking at comments and I saw so many skincare questions that I thought we would just do a skincare Q&A today based on your questions that you sent in through Instagram DMs or below YouTube videos or have emailed me directly because a lot of these are questions that people ask repeatedly. So same question over and over again. So let's just dive right in with the Q&A today. So I think one of the quickest questions to answer is a lot of people have been asking me when or if I'm going to do an update on the Morpheus 8 treatment I had done on my neck a couple of months ago. And I definitely am going to be doing an update on that, but I wanted to wait three months to do the update because that's when you're supposed to see the full results from it. We have another month to wait on that. I had it done in February, so the video will be up for you in May. So no worries, you know, anytime I have a procedure done, I always tell you guys about it and I always do a follow-up video, so this will be no different from that. So look for that in May. All right, so now the next topic is Retin-A. Since I put up my 10 years use of Retin-A video, I've gotten so many questions about how I use Retin-A and I just wanted to clarify a lot of things in that. And so we'll do topical skincare next. So the first question is, do you put Retin-A on your eyelids? And there were a lot of variations on that question. Someone asked, can I use Retin-A under and above the eyes where the skin is especially sensitive. Please share your experience. I'm 36 now and used it only for a few months, but not under eyes. Retin-A 0.025% helped me to get rid of acne, but I don't have any result on skin noticeable after using it for three months. It may not be enough. I stopped because while trying to get pregnant, I'm afraid to experiment with Retin-A. Any thoughts on this? So there's a lot in that question. I think the first question, was very simply put, do I use it on my eyelids? So let's tackle that first. Technically, no, I don't put Retin-A directly on my eyelids. Like when I'm applying it at night, I don't dot it on my eyelids. When I apply my Retin-A, I do apply it underneath my eyes, but only now that I've been using it for a long time. It took me a year to get up to using Retin-A directly under my eyes. I think you do eventually want to acclimate to using it there, but there are certain parts of your face that you just shouldn't use prescription tretinoin because it is too harsh and too irritating for certain spots that have really delicate skin or skin that is considered a mucous membrane and so it's more absorbent. And so those areas are your eyelids, the sides of your nose and around your mouth. And when I first started, I didn't put it around my mouth or around the sides of my nose, but after acclimating to it really slowly over the course of a year, then I did start putting it under my eyes, by the sides of my nose, around my mouth, and I haven't had a problem with it. During that first year though, I would go ahead and put on my next serum right after my Retin-A, and I would put that serum on my eyelids. It would smear it onto my under eyes and up onto my eyelids, just the tiniest, tiniest bit, so that those areas were able to acclimate to it. So the way I do it is I wash my face, then I put on my Retin-A, then I put on a serum afterwards, usually my Matrixyl Synth 6 serum from Timeless, and that's a lightweight, fluidy, very slippery, kind of serum and I put that on and that's the one that gives me the smear of the Retin-A from the rest of my face up onto my eyelids so that they could actually get some benefit of the Retin-A. But the rest of her question here was about having used it for three months, she didn't notice a difference. Now the concentration she was using was kind of the starter concentration of 0.25, which in three months, you're not really gonna to see too much of an anti-aging difference. It really takes nine months to a year before you start seeing any major anti-aging differences using Retin-A. So she definitely didn't use it long enough. But the other part of her question was that she stopped while she was trying to get pregnant, which is definitely a smart thing to do if you're pregnant, trying to get pregnant, definitely do not use Retin-A. If you're using it and you're trying to get pregnant, discontinue and wait until after your childbearing years and then you can start on with it again and then you can use it for the long haul. Next Retin-A question is, should tretinoin be applied first before other skincare? And the answer is usually yes. 
You want to use your most effective thing, your gold standard skincare closest to your skin, as they say, which means you want to get maximum absorption from it and you want it to be the most effective, so you want to put it on first. That's how I do it in my skincare routine. I wash my face and then even though my tretinoin is thicker than my other serums and lotions that I put on after, I do put it on first. But having said that, there are occasions where you don't want to put it on first. If you're just getting started with it, your skin is super sensitive, you might want to do what they call a moisturizer sandwich, where you put on moisturizer first, then you put on your Retin-A, then you put on more moisturizer. There are different ways to use it when you're acclimating, and I'll probably do another video on that pretty soon because I haven't done one in a few years. All right, next question is, how long did the peeling from Retin-A last? And I gotta say, I didn't really have much peeling from Retin-A because I eased into it so very slowly. In years past, the way dermatologists used to tell you how to use Retin-A was to put it on every night and you would go through a really rough stage called the ugly phase, but eventually your skin would acclimate. Well, I feel like now we're much more into being kinder and gentler to our skin and not going through the ugly phase and not having a lot of peeling and irritation just to get to the other side. I think it's a lot healthier for your skin. You don't wanna mess up your skin's barrier only using Retin-A once a week to start is how I did it for like a month. And then the second month, I only used it twice a week, third month, three times a week. If I started getting peeling, I would cut back. And then I'd try to go up again. And then if I went up again and I didn't have any peeling, then I knew that my skin was ready for it. It really took me nine months to a year to get up to using Retin-A every night. So it was a very slow process, but I did manage to avoid most of the peeling and most of the the irritation. The next two questions are still about Retin-A, but specifically about agency. Agency is how I get my tretinoin. It's also how I get another prescription ingredient called hydroquinone. It's a great service that makes custom skincare that's formulated based on a consultation that you have with their skincare providers, and they take into account what you need for your aging skin. So whether your issues are wrinkles or firmness or redness or rosacea or melasma, they can help you because they're medical professionals who can prescribe you the right ingredients at the right concentration in your products. So I'm an agency ambassador. I have been for about a year and a half now. This portion of the video is going to be sponsored by agency. So let me read both of the questions to you. The first one is how do you incorporate your agency skincare with other skincare such as serums, moisturizers, etc.? And then the second question is do they ship your dark spot formula as well as future formula? I'm a little afraid of the usage of hydroquinone. Do you use both or just future formula? Okay, so last question first. <laughs> yes, I use both. I do use the future formula and the dark spot formula. You don't have to get both. You can get just one or just the other. Depends on your skin and your skin needs. So I definitely recommend that everybody get the future formula because that is what contains your Retin-A, your Tretinoin, and that really is the most important anti-aging skincare that we have. It's the one that is proven to work with like 40 years of research that show that it works and that it works so well for reducing wrinkles, for firming up your skin, for reducing discolorations and for building new collagen in your skin, which is really the name of the game in anti-aging skincare. It's all about the collagen, and Retin-A is the most proven ingredient for building new collagen. But then if you also have issues with like redness in your face or dark spots, you know, who at this age doesn't have the telltale side of the cheek dark spot from the car window? I was starting to get a couple up here. I always had some redness across my nose. So I definitely wanted to add in the dark spot formula. And to answer the second part of the second question, which was about the hydroquinone, there's no reason to be afraid of using hydroquinone when you're using a service like Agency because they have taken all the guesswork out of it. They actually send me two different dark spot formulas. So for the first two months, they sent me the dark spot formula with the hydroquinone in it. 
and then they cycle me off the hydroquinone and they send me the bottle without the hydroquinone in it. And the thing is that if you're looking for a topical solution for your dark spots, hydroquinone is the gold standard for spot reduction, for reducing discolorations in your skin. And so you wanna actually use hydroquinone and you don't wanna be afraid of it. And so working with a service like Agency just makes it so easy because they guide you through how to use it. And it takes the guesswork out of it and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about if you're damaging your skin. And what the research shows is that the combination of hydroquinone and tretinoin really is like the double whammy that can really take care of your dark spots and really can improve your skin. So back to the first question, which is how do you incorporate these with your other skincare serums and lotions? They're so easy to incorporate because the ingredients that they formulate together are things that work really well with other ingredients. And the formulations on these are so nice. They're so nice to apply. They're really smooth and lovely. And when I I put my other serums and lotions and things over the top. They don't ball up, they don't pill, they don't come rolling off my face. I love them, they're really well formulated. The Future Formula is used once a day at night and the Dark Spot Formula is used twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, and it goes in perfectly with all my other products. So if you're interested in trying the most effective duo for anti-aging and for dark spots, then there's a link in the information box below the video. Click the link, go over to Agency, upload your pictures, and they will set you up with your provider who will hold your hand, walk you through the process, and you'll be on your way to better skin. All right, next question is, do you wait a couple minutes before replying each skincare step, let each one sink in? And my answer is no, I don't. I just rapid fire them all on there because I like to apply my skincare while my skin is slightly damp. This applies for my face and my body. And I talked about this in a video a couple of weeks ago. If you missed that one, check this one out. When you've washed your face or been in the shower or been in the bath, your skin absorbs quite a bit of water and you want to lock that water into your skin. Your skin is also more absorbent when it's slightly damp and so you get maximal absorption of all your ingredients. I do rapid fire everything on one after the other. I don't wait. Your skin is more absorbent and so they're sinking in better when your skin is slightly damp. Of course I did mention in that video that the exception to the rule is if you have super sensitive skin, then applying things to damp skin, you might have more of a reaction. And sometimes when you're starting with like Retin-A, the best way to do it is to let your face dry completely. All right, here were two questions that were basically the same question, which was, do you do your full skincare routine before you work out? If so, do you redo the whole thing after you shower? And a variation on the theme is, if you work from home and work out three hours after you wake up, would you apply your face care and sunscreen when you wake and again after shower and workout? Or would you just wait until after the workout? So basically I apply my morning skincare once a day. I'm not gonna do it twice in the same day. But there's basically two different ways that I'll do it. If I'm gonna do my skincare in the morning, I'll wake up, wash my face, put on my skincare, put on my sunscreen. Then if I work out a bit later and I say shower or wash my face again, then I won't put on all of my skincare, I'll just re-sunscreen after that. If my face is feeling dry or it's the dead of winter, I might put on a moisturizer plus a sunscreen. And if I'm gonna do it the other way where I'm not going to put on my skincare because I know I'm gonna work out, then I'll wake up, splash my face with water, I'll put on sunscreen, then I'll do my workout, then I'll shower, wash off the sunscreen, then I will put on my full skincare routine, apply my sunscreen again, and then I'll be ready for the day. So either way, I've always got my sunscreen on, but I only apply my actual morning skincare routine once a day. Next question is, if you go to the beach, do you still use all your morning skincare? And kind of like the previous question, yes, I put on my skincare once a day. So if I'm going to the beach that day, I'll wake up, I'll put on my skincare, my entire morning routine, plus my sunscreen. When I'm going to the beach, I generally don't wear makeup. So I'll just bring my sunscreen, which is usually gonna be a tinted mineral sunscreen. And I'll just reapply that once I'm at the beach. Next sunscreen question is, do I put the tinted moisturizer over my sunscreen or under the sunscreen? I use all my skincare and then L to MD. Does the tinted moisturizer go on over all of that? So even though tinted moisturizer is called moisturizer, I think of it as makeup. So 
The way I would do it is I would do all my skincare, then I put on my sunscreen. I like to use a dedicated sunscreen every single day, whether my makeup has sunscreen in it or not. Whether my makeup is called tinted moisturizer or not, I still consider it makeup and I wanna have my nice thick coating of SPF 50 on under that. So my answer is, Put on your sunscreen first always. If you have time, give it 15 to 20 minutes to dry and set. Then whatever your makeup is, if it's a tinted moisturizer, if it's a foundation with sunscreen, it doesn't matter. You put that on after. And even if the tinted moisturizer has sunscreen in it, I would still put on your sunscreen under because most tinted moisturizers or makeup with sunscreen, you're not gonna put on that quarter teaspoon that you need to get the full SPF out of it. So you'll be cutting down the SPF of that product. All right, and here's the last sunscreen question. It's, is it okay to wear both chemical and mineral sunscreen? And if so, do you think that increases your protection even more? I've read that mixing chemical and mineral could reduce efficacy, but I've also read that it's okay to mix. You know, she kind of asked it two different ways. Is it okay to wear chemical and mineral together? And also, is it okay to mix them. I really don't recommend mixing chemical and mineral sunscreens. If you're in the US, most of your chemical sunscreens are gonna have avobenzone in them, and avobenzone is what gives you your UVA coverage in your American chemical sunscreen. Unfortunately, avobenzone is a very unstable character. It's particularly unstable when it's exposed to zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. And those are the two sunscreen ingredients that are used in mineral sunscreens. And the industry does know that and the FDA here in America actually doesn't allow avobenzone to be in a sunscreen that has titanium dioxide or zinc oxide in it. There's been a lot of research done into how to stabilize avobenzone, and there are lots of different chemicals, lots of different sunscreens, lots of different ways that you can even coat the zinc or the titanium dioxide that will actually work to stabilize the avobenzone. The problem is that you don't know how your mineral sunscreen is made. You don't know if it's made with coated zinc or coated titanium dioxide, unless you're gonna be calling up all the manufacturers and being like, hey, how do you make your sunscreen? Are you using coated zinc? Are you using coated di titanium dioxide? I generally don't recommend mixing a standard American chemical sunscreen with a standard mineral sunscreen because that could be giving you less robust UVA coverage. Um, she doesn't say it here, but when she says wear both, I'm guessing maybe layering. So now I know that we're talking about formulating them together is when it degrades, you know, and I don't know if once you apply it to your skin, how much the ingredients of the mineral sunscreen and the chemical sunscreen are mixing on your skin, how close the avobenzone and the zinc and the titanium are getting to each other, how much they're interacting and how much they could be degrading the avobenzone. So I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing you can do. And especially if you're having a hard time finding like a tinted mineral that works for you or you don't like the finish on a chemical sunscreen and you wanna put a tinted mineral on over it to use as your makeup, I think it could be okay as long as you're getting enough UVA protection is the thing that I would be concerned about. And uh, it's interesting, uh, my sister and I were just talking about this the other night because she was asking me like about how she applies her sunscreen and if it's okay. And the way she does it is she doesn't like any one sunscreen to put on a full quarter teaspoon. So what she does is she takes an eighth of a teaspoon of a chemical sunscreen and an eighth of a teaspoon of a mineral sunscreen. She puts the chemical one on first. I don't know if she gives it time to dry and set and then she puts on the mineral one, right? And she was saying that she thinks that she's probably coming out with about an SPF 30 doing that because the mineral sunscreen she uses is a 44, but the chemical sunscreen she uses is an SPF 30. So I said, let's just break it down and do the math on it. So if you're using half as much of an SPF 30, then what you're giving yourself is an SPF 15 with your chemical sunscreen. And then if you're putting on an SPF 44, but you're only using half as much, then you're getting only a 22 out of this. I think she's shortchanging herself because I don't think she's getting the 30. I think she's getting the 22 and I think she's getting even lower UVA uh, coverage. So I would recommend in that case, rather than using a standard US sunscreen with avobenzone in it as your bottom layer sunscreen, and an SPF 30. If you want to use half of something, I would get an SPF 50 and I would probably get a European chemical sunscreen. 
something like the Beauty of Joseon sunscreen, which is an SPF 50. If you're only gonna use half as much as this, at least you would be getting an SPF of 25 with a fairly robust UVA. And this doesn't have avobenzone in it. And so hopefully those European ingredients are more stable in the presence of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And then you could put this on over it and at that point, maybe you would be getting like a 25 and approaching more being closer to the 30. Or my other suggestion would be for the chemical sunscreen, I would go with one of the really high SPF Neutrogena sunscreens because they make one that's like a 70 or a 60. So if you're only gonna use half as much of that, at least you're getting to a 30 by using half the amount, right? And then you can put this over it and not worry so much about the degradation aspect of it. But yeah, it's a tough quandary. It sounds like a lot of people are doing that. If you're layering, it's probably a little bit safer than mixing. All right, last section is gonna be the at-home gadgets. The first question is about the Omnilux mask. This is my LED red light mask. I wear it every other day and I love the results I've gotten with this on my skin. But the questions are, do you wash your face before using the Omnilux mask? As you guys know, I don't. Um, but I use it first thing in the morning, right after my eyes pop open, I keep it on my bedside table. So I grab my mask, I drape it on my face, I put on my neck one, I put on my hand mitt, and then I go back to sleep for 10 minutes. So I don't wash my face, but I consider my face clean from the night before when I washed it and did my skincare routine. And then the second Omnilux question is, which serum do you use with your Omnilux mask? And since I do it that way, I don't use a serum with my Omnilux mask. You can. Uh, Omnilux actually sells a hydrating mask that you can put on. It's clear so that the light can get through it. But I think that has like hyaluronic acid and some green tea and maybe some niacinamide in it. I know there are some companies that will say their serum can increase the results of your red light mask. This uh, Maysama company that sells a rooibos tea serum and they did some independent research that shows that their serum using it with an LED mask actually really increases the elasticity in the skin and some other things. You know, they paid for the research, so of course you have to take it with a grain of salt. I guess it could help. It can't hurt to put on a green tea serum. I don't know if you need that one. I don't think there's a reason to spend a lot on one. I think any green tea thing would probably give the same results, but I don't know that for sure. And the last two questions are about the new face. The first one is which conducting gel do you use with new face? Is there a cheaper option? And then the second new face question was when do you use your new face? I hate having to put the conductor gel on and then clean it off. Can't seem to find a place to fit it into my routine with the Nera and the Omnilux. So many tools, when do you use them? So the first question, I use the New Face gel with my New Face, and this is my new New Face, the one I've been using. And I just love the New Face gel. It's the one that works best for me. It is a little spendy. I usually buy this big bottle like during the Sephora sale, but this will last me for, you know, six months at least. I really like this one a lot because it's very lightweight. It cleans off easily. It doesn't seem to leave a film on my skin, which is good. But another option is at Target, they have a aloe gel. It's the Up and Up brand. 99.7% pure aloe gel and you can get that one and use it. I used to use it but eventually there was like some vapors that <laughs> made my eyes sting so I stopped using that went back to this one. I just love this one it's just for me it's the best and this is the one that I continue to use. Um, as far as the conductor gel and cleaning it off I mean they make this one so that you can rub it in it's kind of like called the primer gel. I don't do that I do clean it off wet up my wonder cloth, wipe my face, and then splash it because of course, right after I do my new face routine, I am then putting on my skincare because I do it in the morning. And so I want my skincare to penetrate and I don't want to have a thick layer of gel between my skincare and my skin. So I do wash it off and that would be my advice for you to do it too, but if you use the new face gel, you can rub it in. Now, as far as using so many devices, I use my Omnilux mask and my new face in the morning, but I don't do them on the same day ever. I just alternate days. So if today I did the Omnilux mask, tomorrow I'll do the new face. And then the next day, Omnilux, new face, Omnilux, new face, and on like that till the week is done, then I rotate it around the next week. So that's how I do those. I do the Nira at night 
So that doesn't really interfere with anything. I wash my face, I let it dry, then I do the Nira, then I go in and put on my skincare. And that's how I use that one. And that one you're supposed to use every single night. For the new face, if you're just starting with it, you are supposed to use it minimum five days a week. So during that time, you might not be able to alternate it with your Omnilux mask. You might have to use your Omnilux mask and your new face on the same day, which is fine. Nira, you are supposed to use every day. So if you're gonna work that into your schedule, then you need a spot where you can do it every day without some other thing trying to bump it out of the way, right? So that's why I do it at night. So that's how I work all my at-home devices into my schedule and I love them all. So we've come to the end of the questions for today's skincare Q&A. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it helpful and informative. If you did, give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. As always, I thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your watching. I hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.